Hello everyone and welcome to part four of the single stage endurance challenge. If you haven't watched the first three parts, I recommend you do so now. As a refresher in this challenge, we're trying to visit and land on as many destinations in the Kerbal system as possible without doing any refueling or staging. So far, we've landed on Minmus, Gilly, Bop, Pole, and most recently, Dress. We had just landed on Dress at the end of part three, and that is where we will begin part four. For the ascent, we don't want to pick up too much speed on the surface, so we're just going to let ourselves coast down this valley. And then once in the bottom of the valley, we're going to turn on all the engines and take off using one of the small crests. Once we're in the air, we do want as much TWR as possible again, so we're going to turn on the LVN engines. As with the descent, the liquid fuel is the heaviest, so we want to minimize the use of these. So we're just going to leave the LVNs on long enough, such that we'll be able to achieve the remaining amount of delta V needed to circularize with the electrical charge left in the battery banks. At this point in the mission, I realized I had, might have a little bit of a problem. Due to the massive time that would have been necessary to do a complete trial run of this mission, I had just figured out how much fuel I needed mathematically, and then left some extra for anything that might happen. As a result, I've actually used less liquid fuel than I intended, which, due to the weight of this fuel, will reduce the amount of delta V I have from the xenon gas. So as a result, on future landings, I might be using a little bit more liquid fuel than necessary, just to make sure that my craft isn't remaining too heavy. You may remember from part three that Dress is the most isolated planet in terms of delta V between a high elliptical orbit and a transfer orbit to the closest planet in the entire Kerbal system. On the way in, we used multiple capture burns with some orbits of Kerbal in between. We're gonna be doing the same thing here with multiple ejections burns, with the first one putting us into a resonant orbit that'll get us a second rendezvous with Dress before doing our final ejection, which will be to Joule, which is the closest planet in terms of Delta V. While I appreciate the comments indicating that this was some kind of fancy maneuver, it's really a lot easier than doing a gravity assist in terms of the math and planning involved. I should note that this maneuver is generally not necessary to eject or inject into dress. Due to the relatively low mass of the planet, the Oberth effect is correspondingly small. The amount of delta V gained from this is also quite small, but due to the limited amount of electrical charge in a single charge of the battery banks, I had to split this into two maneuvers, and the only practical way to do that was to split the ejection burns and put resonant orbits in between. Since we're approaching Joule from Dress rather than from Kerbin, our velocity relative to Joule is a little bit lower than normal, and as a result, I'm going to use Lathe to capture. There isn't a particularly crafty reason that I'm doing this. Lathe just happened to be in a more convenient spot that required less adjustments. And because our velocity relative to Joule is lower, we don't need as much of a gravity assist to capture. After some orbits of Joule, we're going to use Tylo to eject us into a transfer orbit to Kerbin. Though I will give you a spoiler alert, the Mun is not our next destination. You may notice in this video and my other videos and even other people's videos that the Kerbin Eve, Kerbin, Kerbin, Joule gravity assist route, and the reverse of that route in this case, is repeated quite a lot. It really is the most important gravity assist to know. Because Kerbin is the closest planet in terms of delta V to Duna and Eve, and Joule is the closest planet in terms of delta V to Dress and Elu, that knowing this gravity assist will let you get the most efficient transfer between any two planets in the system, excepting Moho, where you need to know how to do a gravity assist off of Eve. With that said, this is going to be a bit of a variation on a theme. Due to the safe and easy arrow braking available on Duna, I'm not too worried about a little bit higher relative velocity when we approach the planet, and as a result, I'm only going to need two assists off of Kerbin, and I can skip the Eve assist here. Because Duna's mass and, correspondingly, its orbital speed is quite low, speeds just don't get that high here, and as a result, it's almost always possible to safely arrow break into a captured orbit of Duna without using any fuel. I've done my arrow braking pass high enough that I've left my apoapsis quite high. As some of you may have guessed, we're not actually going to be landing on the planet Duna. Its gravity is too high for the amount of TWR that we have, and the atmosphere would just make things worse to actually try to take off here. Instead, we're going to be landing on its moon Ike. Other than Grand Tours, I've only used Ike as a means to gravity assist off of Duna, so it'll be nice to actually make it there. 
Landing on Ike is going to be quite similar to landing on Dress. Their gravities are almost the same, so as a result we're going to be using the same approach of trying to maximize our use of the ion engines, limited by the battery banks, and then using liquid fuel to do the rest. I was a little bit concerned about the landing on this moon because it's a little bit more rugged than Dress and I'm just not too familiar with landing here, but I had planned to land at a little bit lower surface speed than I had before, and it turned out to not be much of a problem. In addition to offering high altitude and a relatively flat landing area, this spot also offered a near-perfect takeoff run. I had enough flat area to pick up a lot of speed on the surface with the ion engines, which will save us some liquid fuel, and we even had a ramp to allow us to vault into an ascent Russian aircraft carrier style. The high takeoff altitude and the ski jump were both helpful because, since I'm less familiar with this moon, it was nice to not have to worry about any high obstacles in our ascent path. Before ejecting from Duna, we do want to eject into an elliptical orbit with a periapsis next to Duna. While Duna and Ike have the closest relationship in terms of mass between a planet and moon in the game, we still want the more heavier planet to get the maximum use of the Oberth effect. Our ejection is going to put us onto a transfer with Kerbin because, as mentioned before, it is the closest planet in terms of delta v. But we still have plenty of fuel left, so we're not going to be doing the moon just yet, and we're going to be continuing on and using Kerbin as a gravity assist to our next real destination, which will be the ice planet of Elu. While I do think it would be possible to skip some of the assists in this case, the best transfer I found from Duna to Joule was the stereotypical Kerbin Eve, Kerbin, Kerbin, Jewel route that we've used so many times before. Now someone asked in the last video what other destinations I plan to go to in this series. After this video I feel like you guys should have a pretty good idea of what my itinerary is going to be, so see if you can give it a guess in the comments. If you are the first to get it right, I'll give you a shout out in the final video. Getting back to the maneuvers at hand, we're going to use a Tylo assist to capture us in orbit of Joule, and some orbits of Joule later, we're going to use another assist off of Tylo to eject us onto a transfer orbit to Elu. The transfer from Joule to Elu is a bit strange due to the relatively close altitude of the two planets, as well as the very high eccentricity of Elu, so it's really important here to use a transfer window planner rather than just trying to eyeball it. Due to the inclination of ELU, any approach from Joule is going to have quite a lot of normal velocity. And since ELU has a pretty good spin, somewhere around 68 meters per second rotational velocity, we definitely want to have an equatorial orbit before we go to a low orbit. So it's generally a pretty good idea to do a small normal burn to get you into a non-inclined orbit before burning into a low orbit. While ELU has about 50% more gravity compared to Dress and Ike, we're also a bit lighter now because we've used some liquid fuel, so landing here is going to be quite similar to our last two landings. One thing I do want to point out that this was the point at which, looking at my charts, I really was confident that I had more surplus liquid fuel compared to what I had, and I knew this extra weight was going to start becoming a bit of a drain on our xenon fuel, so I definitely made a point of using a little bit extra liquid fuel compared to what I need to, and you'll notice that I had a little bit of extra battery banks upon landing. One great thing about landing on Elu is the whole planet is quite flat, so even if you pick a landing zone at random, you're fairly likely to have a good landing spot. I did aim for an area that's a little bit higher than the rest of the planet, and as a result, I almost landed in a big trench, which would have been really bad. During testing, I had been able to land here at as much as 50 meters per second, but I'm cutting a lot of things close here, including the ion feel and our available TWR and landings. So I wanted to keep our fuel levels at exactly how much I had on my planned charts, and no more, no less. After partaking of Elu's cheap ice cream and bad Matt Lounge jokes, we're ready to head off to our next destination. One of the disadvantages of Elu's smoothness is there's not a lot of natural ramps to take off from, but I was able to find enough of a crest that gave me just enough boost to get enough angle to actually ascend. As with the descent, we need a fairly high angle of attack to keep us from crashing into the ground. One thing that helped a lot here was getting all the way up to 60 meters per second, just using the ion engines during takeoff. This allows us to leave the LVN engines on longer, which helps us a little bit with our elevation. 
Regardless of where our next destination is, our next transfer is definitely going to be to Joule. Once you have a high elliptical orbit around ELU, it takes a very small amount of delta V to actually get you a full transfer. After waiting for an ideal transfer, just 9 meters per second from an elliptical ELU orbit was enough to get us all the way to a transfer with Joule. After reaching Joule, we're going to use Tylo to capture in our fourth capture around Joule, and the third using Tylo in this mission. I'm going to do then a gravity assist around Leith and then another gravity assist off of Tylo, which will slow us down a bit. Since we're slowing down rather than staying in a high elliptical Joule orbit, this means that we are indeed trying to capture here. Our next destination will be my personal favorite, which is Leith. Now during this maneuver to Joule, obviously we've already actually gone to Leith, but the first time our relative velocity was way too high to actually safely capture using aero braking, which is why we did those two more assists just to slow us down a bit. Thanks to this extra work, we were able to keep heating during the aero braking pass down to an OSHA approved level. Since Leith is my favorite destination, I'm going to leave that to open the next and final video in this series. If you think you can guess what the rest of my itinerary is going to be, don't forget to leave a comment. Thank you everyone very much for watching, and stay tuned for the final video.